Well, good morning, everyone. So today we pick up in John 17, 6 through 10. In less than 24 hours from our text, Jesus will be nailed to a cross on a hillside in Jerusalem. At about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus will declare it is finished. He would bow his head and give up his spirit. When we refer to the finished work of Christ, we are speaking only of his priestly work in offering himself as a perfect atonement for sin. For there is one aspect of our Lord's priestly ministry that is not finished, but is ongoing. Hebrews 7.25 explains it. Christ always lives to make intercession for his people. This past Friday evening at sunset began the Jewish celebration of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, spoken of in Leviticus 16. The Day of Atonement was the only day when the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies. The inner room of the tabernacle, or the temple, with incense and to sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice for the purification of sin. Then he would offer prayers of intercession to God for the forgiveness of his people. The priestly ministry of Israel requires not one, but two essential tasks. First, the offering was made in blood to satisfy God's justice for sin. Second, intercession was made to God on the basis of that sacrifice. Puritan John Owen writes, to offer and to intercede, to sacrifice and to pray are both acts of the same sacerdotal office and both require in him who is priest. The Christian hope of salvation therefore rests on both Christ's dying and Christ's praying. Owen says that by the one, he has procured all good things for us, and by the other, he will procure them to be actually bestowed. Thereby, he does never leave our sin, but follows them into every court until they be fully pardoned and clearly expiated. These words remind us not to discount Jesus' prayer on the night of his arrest. As God's Son came forth as the saving priest for his people, he came both to die and to make intercession. This intercession would not end here at the Kidron Brook, but would continue after Christ's resurrection and into the eternal future. Paul therefore asks, who is to condemn? Christ? Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God interceding for us. Therefore, the high priestly prayer recorded here in John 17 was really the beginning of his eternal priestly intercession offered for us. and it's based on his once and for all atoning death. So to better understand our text today, I'm gonna begin at verse nine, since it naturally provides a solid theological foundation on which to build uh, verses six, seven, eight, and 10. So last week, Pastor Rich preached on Jesus having prayed uh, for his own consecration and taking up the cross in verses one through five. Jesus now takes up his priestly intercession in prayer and he begins by specifying precisely who he's praying for. So in verse nine, it says, I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me for they are yours. This is the interceding prayer of the high priest on behalf of the people whom he represents to God, namely those whom God gave him. 
who are the very people for whom Jesus was prepared to offer his own blood as an atoning sacrifice. Christ specifies that his priestly prayer is for particular persons, not for the world generally. Jesus offers salvation for the entire world, but he intercedes as priest before God to effect salvation only for those who, he, who belong to him, dying to atone for their sins, and then sending the Spirit to open their hearts to saving faith. Reformed theologians have emphasized that Jesus' entire priestly ministry, including the atoning sacrifice of blood, takes this particular rather than a general shape. Since the priest's the offering and the priestly intercession were always performed together, Jesus prays as high priest for the very people for whom he is about to die. Namely, Jesus says, for the elect and not for the world in general. The doctrine associated with Jesus' statement is called limited atonement, or in a more positive label, particular redemption. The doctrine notes that while Jesus' death extends a, a gospel invitation to all the world, the actual atonement was offered only for his own people, whom the Father had given him from all eternity. To teach otherwise is to assert that Jesus atoned for sins that are not actually forgiven. He see, we see this particular focus throughout the Bible's teaching on the cross. The angel told Joseph to name Mary's son Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's Matthew 1. Jesus taught that he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a many for all? No, a ransom for many. We cannot say that Christ died for all, and only intercedes for some. Since Paul says that Christ who died for us also intercedes for us. The value of particular redemption lies in realizing that Jesus did not make his atonement merely for the cause of salvation, or only for the possibility for sinners being forgiven. Instead, Jesus died to atone for the particular sins of his actual people. If you believe in Christ, you may say with perfect accuracy that Jesus died for me and to pay the debts for my sins. Likewise, Jesus here specifies that his priestly intercession is not for the world in general, but is offered for those elect people known personally to him in all eternity and given to him by the Father to be his precious own. To say that Jesus died generally for all people, even though he prays here only for his own, is to disregard the unity of the priest's sin atoning work and to deny the clear implication of what Jesus here emphasizes. So who are these people of Christ? The primary description the one that he repeats no fewer than five times throughout this prayer, those for whom Jesus intercedes to the Father are those whom you have given me, for they were yours. The people of Christ are those whom the Father has given the Son. So now building on this truth, we're going to go into verse six. Uh, so we're gonna look at the five marks or that identify those that Jesus is describing as the, these people of Christ. So number one will be those whom Christ manifested the Father's name. Number two will be whom Christ took out of the world. Three whom have kept God's word, four, who received Jesus as the one sent from God, and number five,
by whom Jesus is glorified in them. So number one, the people of Christ are those whom Jesus has manifested God's name. So when God chose a people and gave them to Christ, those people were also brought into relationship with the Father and became important to God's saving mission in the world. So verse six, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me. The Lord defines those whom he was praying first by all those to whom he has manifested the Father's name. So, this manifested. If you want to also see this word used um, on a whole side study, I, I would have loved to have launched into this uh, tangential, uh, but it would have been a whole different uh, sermon. Read um, Romans 3, 21 through like 26. And you'll see repeated three times God demonstrating or manifesting um, his righteousness. But here, manifest, he, who God, who, had, who Jesus had manifested, it's translated, this word means to just to reveal or to make known or to show. The orest tense of the word denotes that this was accomplished, uh, it was an accomplished fact. This and it's the one that Christ had perfectly finished according to the Father's plan. The concept of God's name. So he says, so what does he mean when he says that I manifested your name? So the name here, I believe from all the study I had put into that, I believe that it's Jesus manifested the character and nature and attributes of God. So name is more than just, you know, is your name Ed or Bob? It's a name was who you are. And it denotes, um, back in olden days, some of us with gray hair will remember this, people cared about, you know, you ever have your parents say, you know, don't do anything to embarrass our family's name? or to bring shame upon our family's name. A name meant something a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> you can read about it somewhere, I'm sure. But name in the Bible, God's name. Do you remember when Moses is talking, uh, when he asks God, show me your glory? And then when he reveals himself, he doesn't just pass by, but he says, he talks about, he says, I am the Lord God. You know, and he describes his character and who he is. That is God's glory. When we love God, we love who God is. And so Jesus came to manifest God the Father so we could understand him. So the supreme manifestation of the name of God was the Lord Jesus Christ, God in human flesh. So perfectly and completely did Jesus reveal God's nature and character that he could make the shocking statements, he who sees me sees the one who sent me. Remember that back in John 12. And then he said, he who has seen me has seen the Father, John 14. The New Testament writers declared him to be the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation in whom the fullness of the deity dwells bodily form, who existed in the form of God and is the radiance of the glory and the exact representation of his nature. Jesus emphasized, his emphasis of this manifestation of God's name reminds us of the urgent importance to know God. Nothing is more important to us than to know God as he is revealed in the pages of scripture. Just last week, Pastor Rich preached from what? Uh, verse, 13, uh, verse three of John 17. And this is eternal life that you know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. That's, that's the essence, that's why we're here. That's the whole purpose. Otherwise you guys gotta stay at home in bed today. 
but we're here to know God because therein lies eternal life. So the second characteristic is that Christ, who, whom Christ has taken out of the world, the people of Christ are those who've been taken out of the world. So what does he mean by this? We haven't gone anywhere yet. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Here we see that Christians have been separated out of the world and are called to live in a different way and in a different power. According to the Bible, there's a great division in mankind. There are some who belong to the world and others who have been separated out of the world. And this is out of the world system, out of the, the evil, godless, satanically ruled system that erodes and infects everything. You can hardly watch television, watch the news. Forget watching any sort of political stuff. You can see it's this insidiousness in this world. That is the evil world system. We're not to be a part of that. We're separated. And this is what holiness is. When the Bible tells us to be holy, it's, it's not some, you know, holier than thou thing, as people say. It's a consecration. It's being separated. But it's not just merely being separated. It's being separated what? Unto God. So Christians are no longer part of the world and having been rescued from the domain of darkness, as Paul said in uh, Colossians, and transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. Earlier that evening, Jesus had told the disciples, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. So nobody's going to be excited that you're a Christian. Okay, uh, Thanksgiving's coming up, right? You're going to have family and stuff. Tell them all about the gospel. Tell them how much you love Jesus. And we'll see how much they enjoy your company this year. Right? Because you're different. Because you're called out of the world. Nobody is going to congratulate you. So Peter describes in 2 Peter 2.9, but you are a chosen family, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellence of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. You can't have both. It's not a cake and eat it too. It's Christ or it's the world. We are not only chosen, raised in a royal priesthood, but a holy nation. This word nation is ethnos. It's where we get the word ethnic from. It simply means a people. That's why I entitled this, uh, to be Christ's people, the people of Christ. We belong to him. To, we are set apart to him. Now what does that mean? It means that we have been set apart unto God. Yes, set apart for service, but primarily set apart to relationship. When you got married, if, there's, if you're a married folk out there, you were set apart on that day. You were no longer going willy-nilly wherever you want you know, with whoever you want. You are set apart unto your spouse. And so we are set apart unto Christ. And if you were in Christ, then at your salvation you were taken out of the kingdom of darkness and placed into the kingdom of God's dear Son. You were taken out of death and put into life. You are God's possession. That is your positional sanctification. 
but there's a progressive reality that you must continually live more and more in a holy way so that you live out your life the reality that of your position in which in Christ it's it's becoming who you are you yes Christ looks at you and he sees the righteousness of his son but then we we live in a manner so that we reflect the character of our father so that when people see us they see the family resemblance So we have a wonderful privilege. We're now a holy people. We're no longer are owned by Satan. We're no longer in bondage to sin. We have entered into a new relationship. And progressively and practically, we work towards living in the light of that holy identity. We are a holy people called to be holy. And we are called to be set apart to God. Number three, the people of Christ are given to Christ by the Father. Here, Christ's statement, they were yours and you, were, and you gave them to me, is a strong theological affirmation that even before their conversion, the people of Christ belong to God. Earlier in John's Gospel, the Lord had declared, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will not cast out. In Acts 13, 48, we're told that after the apostle Paul finished preaching at uh, Pisidian Antioch, the Gentiles began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. Now get this. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Did you hear that? It, it says, as many had been appointed to eternal life believed. It doesn't say, as many as believed were appointed to eternal life. They were appointed to eternal life before they even believed. Now, they, of course, had to be drawn, you know, as Jesus had said that my father you know, nobody can come to me unless my Father draws them. They weren't saved, even though God knew them. They were gods before uh, the foundations of the world, before, you know, and they were given to Christ. But they still needed to receive Christ. So they were appointed to eternal life before they believed. This is what Paul meant in Ephesians 1, 4. It says, he, God the Father, chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundations of the world. Jesus said back in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will in no way cast out. So having chosen to redeem them, the Father gave them to the Son as a gift of his love. Thus, as earlier demonstrated, the disciples into and extension the believers in verse 20 of uh, chapter uh, 17 we'll see that as Jesus is praying he says to the father I'm not praying for the disciples only but I'm praying for all those who will believe through their word that's you and I the only way the way that we know the the Bible the way that we know the gospel is because of faithful men and women who have passed it down since the time of the disciples. Having chosen to redeem them, the Father gave them to the Son as a gift. And so we, be, we are infinitely precious to the Son, not because of anything intrinsically precious about us or valuable about us, but because they were promised to him by the Father from the beginning of time. Think about that. Sometime when you're praying and meditating, think about that you are a gift from the Father to the Son, that he knew you before you were even born. 
And because of that, and that's a precious gift from the Father to the Son, because of that, what do you think his intercession is for you? Is it in Jeremiah? He says, I know my thoughts toward you. They're for good and not for evil. They're for a hope and for a future. I know life is hard and things are hard. But he ever lives to make intercession for us. He who has begun a good work in you, he's going to continue it until the day of Christ. Because he's praying for you. Number four, they are kept. They have kept God's word. The people of Christ are those who keep God's word. So, verse seven, uh, 6 there, they have kept your word. The word kept means to lay a hold of, to secure. You're drowning in the ocean and somebody throws you a life ring. How do you, what do you do with it? You just like, oh yeah. No, you grab it. That's what we do with the word of God. You hold on to it for dear life. It is the truth of God. So we keep the word of God. Jesus warned of a person who hears my words and does not keep them. Later, Jesus states, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Yet whoever does not love me does not keep my commandments. Do you see the pattern? It is clear that Jesus means not merely assenting to the teaching, but embracing it as a lifestyle of obedience. If you believe a thing to be true, then don't you do it? It'd be foolish not to. During Jesus' ministry, there were a multitudes who heard his teachings, right? But they did not keep his words. You know, in particular, was, do you remember the large crowd that um, were miraculously fed a few fish and loaves? But then they choked on his teaching. They complained, oh, this is a hard saying. I don't know if I, you know, we can do it. And what did they do? They left. There's a lot in our culture today, a lot of people, a lot of churches that choke at the word of God because it doesn't fit how they think Christianity or, in their words, how a loving God ought to do it. And so they choke on it. And what do they do? They walk away. They edit, so to speak, their Bibles. So how different, though, are the people of God? They kept God's word. This does not mean that they, 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 didn't, they didn't just merely didn't walk away. It, it, it doesn't mean that they, they didn't make objections. I mean, they, or they just nodded their heads. The fact is, do you, you do not really keep God's word unless you obey it. So it's much more than just agreeing with it or not putting up objections to it. Are you doing it? You can't just, it's not just keeping it in your intellect, agreeing with the, well, that's a sound analytical argument for well-being and good life. No, that's not enough. That's not going to be enough. It's got to be in your heart. It's got to move your will. And by the way, you can't do it by yourself. It is only through the Spirit of God. The person who keeps the Word of God is the one whose whole, whose whole personality is keeping it. The one who is meditating on it and rejoicing in it whose heart warms to it and obeys it. Read Psalm 119 sometime. This is a long one. But I would love, I would love to love the word of God like that. 
we sang that song, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. He goes through all the various ways that, that he loves the word of God, and we need to cultivate that. If we believe what we say we believe, that it is truly is the word of God to us, penned by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and it is exactly what he would say to us, then it, we, it should take on a whole different life with us. So we must learn to not just obey it. It can't be just a formal obedience. It, it needs to include treasuring God's word. How will we be the people of Christ whose word, whose word increasingly shapes our minds, our wills, and our affections. The answer is by keeping his scripture as a prized resource. In Psalm 1, where the man of God is contrasted to a man walking in the count, he's contrasted against the man who is walking in the counsel of this world. We're told he delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by the streams of water that yield its fruit in the seasons, and its leaf does not wilt, wither. In all he does, he prospers. So the people of God keep the word of God. A little later is a spoiler alert in 17. Jesus will say to the Father, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. We're sanctified. It has a work within us. Have you ever heard a scripture that wouldn't leave you alone? You hear it late, maybe on the radio, or you read it. And sometimes God will have it both things. You'll read it that morning, then it'll come on the radio, and then somebody else will say it. You're like, okay, already. <clears throat> and then it works, it does a work in you. It won't leave you alone, it wakes you up in the middle of the night, requiring that you do something with it. It is not this, the Word of God isn't like any other book we read. It's not just a book, it is the very Word of God. So, number five, uh, the people of Christ are those. who received Jesus as Savior. So first we saw that there is those who Jesus has manifested God's name, who have, he has taken out of the world, who are given to Christ by the Father, who have kept his word, and then finally, it is those whom Jesus, who receive Jesus as Savior, sent from God. So verses seven and eight, Jesus says, now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know the truth, that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Jesus has described his people in their relationship to God, to the world, and to the word of God. And finally, the people of Christ are known by receiving the testimony of Jesus himself and believe as truth that Jesus came from God the Father. Many people in the world admire Jesus in some way, but saving faith requires us to realize the relationship between Jesus and the Heavenly Father. The disciples had noted all that Jesus, his, like his, his grace, his power, his wisdom, his holiness, and his love. Now Jesus has declared that they know that everything that you have given me is from you. Do you remember all as we've been studying through John, Jesus would say, I didn't receive this from myself, this is from the Father. He made a, a point of saying, I'm not just making this up as I go along. All of this is from the Father. 
And even though the disciples did not understand it perfectly at this place, and just because you don't understand it perfectly at this place, Christ is saying that they know that everything that you have given me is from the Father. And that's an important theological distinction. What he's saying is that he is God, that Jesus Christ, to come from the Father. Remember how many times the Pharisees and the uh, religious leaders tried to stone him whenever he said this? This is what he meant. He was, he was asserting that he is God. And so the grace of Jesus is the grace of God. The power of Jesus is the power of God. And the truth of Jesus is the truth of God. And the blood of Jesus was offered by God for the cleansing and for our forgiveness. And then seeing that everything in Jesus is of God, the people received Jesus as the sum and the fulfillment of the word of God. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them. It is important truth that Jesus' people keep God's word, but Jesus here emphasizes that keeping God's word directs us to Jesus himself. Do you remember the, the Pharisees who had said, and Jesus had noted there, I think it was in uh, verse 5, you know, the, the Pharisees always kept this radical obedience to the law. And they would even not just keep the law, but they would add layers on to it. To, so to be extra specially, what they thought they were being holy. But Jesus says in chapter 5 of John 39, he says to them, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it's they that testify about me and you are unwilling to come to me that you may have life. The whole point from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is just one sign, one point, one arrow that points to Jesus Christ. All of the Old Testament prophecies, every sacrifice, everything was a sign to, to move us, to bring us to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as our Savior. But Christ's people also hear the call of Jesus in God's words. Jesus concluded, they have believed that you sent me. The people of Christ have searched the scriptures. They have compared the claims of Jesus with the teachings of the whole Bible, and they have found that Jesus is, in fact, the one foretold by God. You must arrive at that conclusion. And if you've not read, now I think about, I just had a, a total like, you ever get one of those tangential thoughts? I was a, a guy, Blind Willie Johnson, a jazz player, um, or blues, I should say. He uh, said, he sang a song, Ain't Nobody's Fault But Mine. He says, I got a Bible and I can read. And if I fail to read it and my soul be lost, it ain't nobody's fault but mine. We all have the word of God. And I would venture to guess in many of your households, you've got dozens of copies. If you got a cellular phone, oh, forget about it. <laughs> but are we reading them? And not just reading them, are we loving them and is it changing us? Is it pointing us to Christ? It might be that Christ's people sometimes do not fully understand everything in the Bible correctly. And that they might have much yet to learn and much holiness still to attain. That's, that's me. But they know that Jesus Christ is the Savior promised by God in the scripture. Jesus prayed that they have received 
the words that you gave me and have come to know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. The people of Christ read the Bible. They read its accounts in Jesus' life, his ministry, his doctrine, examining Jesus' claims as the one who fulfills God's ancient prophecies, the promises of salvation, and so reading the Spirit of God testifies that the Word is truth. The Spirit of God testifies that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and there is salvation in no other name, for there is no other name under heaven in which a man can be saved. So we're given by God according to Jesus. Faith is not something attained by us, but rather given to us. Notice the frequency with which Jesus uses the term gave or given in this passage. It occurs five times. This is why Paul says that salvation and faith are a gift from God. For By grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. It's Ephesians 2. This means that if you, you're struggling to receive Christ or unsure that you're among Christ's people, you should ask God to give you faith and salvation. And in the end, as in the beginning, faith in Jesus is a gift from God. Now, someone might ask, what if I desire to follow Christ, but I'm not chosen? What if I wasn't given to Christ? If you seek to be counted among the people of Christ, to be reconciled to God, if you desire forgiveness of your sins and to receive eternal life, I have to ask you, what compelled you to come here today? Was your bed not comfortable enough? Did you have nothing else to do on a beautiful autumn day? Well, I, I gotta tell you, it wasn't anything in you, in your selfish, sinful person. You were compelled by God to be here today. There are none righteous, the Bible says. There's nobody who seeks God. The fact that your soul, something has stirred in you to come here, to worship him, to hear his word. I would dare say God has drawn you, people. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and no one who comes to me will I cast out. So if you have that desire, some inkling, and it might be the smallest thing, it is from God, it is not from you. As we recap verses 9 and 10, as I've already said in 9, Jesus not only states that he prays for his people, but he also explains why he prays for his people. He gives two reasons. The first of which is that he prays is that his people belong to the Father and were given to Jesus by the Father. He says, I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you gave me out of gave me for they were yours and they were yours and you gave them to me the people of christ were especially loved by jesus because they were chosen by the father from all eternity and he's entrusted by the father with salvation this by the way tells us how we should think of one another as fellow christians is one who belongs to god you are precious to God. So I better be very careful when I, how I treat you and how we treat one another. The second reason Jesus prays for his people is that as he prays, he says, I am glorified in them. Surely it should thrill us that Jesus treasures us because we belong to the Father, but here he adds, I'm glorified in them. 
You know your life. I know mine. Got to tell you, it ain't much very glorifying in that. I know the truth of me. God knows the truth of me, and he knows the truth of you. And yet you bring him glory because you believe in his son. Jesus is glorified first by his work of grace and salvation. Jesus offers himself for sinful, lost, blind, and unworthy sinners. He cleanses us from our sin by his blood and renews our souls with his life-giving spirit. Surely, if the Apostle Paul could refer to the church at Philippi as my joy and my crown, then Christ is glorified in every sinner who is cleansed and set free to live for God. Second, Jesus is glorified in his people to the degree that they leave, live holy lives, that we, we demonstrate that family resemblance. Do you remember when your kids were growing up and you'd see them do stuff like you? Like the good stuff, you know. And you, it, that's the glory when God sees that change brought about in you by his spirit. It brings him glory. It brings him a pleasure. Titus 2.14 that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all, all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. This is our true incentive to turning from sin, for cultivating holy graces, pursuing good works in Christ, that Jesus might be glorified. We don't do it so that other people go, oh my, he's quite holy. No, but we don't do it for any other reason but to bring glory to God. And third, Jesus is glorified by our bold confession of faith. Are you living as a secret Christian? Are you frightened that your coworkers or your neighbors might discover that you trust and serve the Lord Jesus Christ? Ultimately, no Christian can remain undercover. And desiring for Christ to be glorified, we should live openly before the world in obedience to his word. This brings glory to Christ. In conclusion, with all these reasons ringing in our hearts, we should come away from Christ's prayer in John 17, amazed at the honor that he has bestowed on us. As you depart from church and head back to the world, you sh should hear Jesus say, you are the fathers and are given to me and I am glorified in you. What greater incentive can there be for us to live for him and to know him that he owns us and is glorified in us. Of that worth, of the, I guess, what is the value of everything else? The cheap trinkets, the fickle accolades of this world, they're meaningless. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world? To lose his soul. Our Lord's atonement has set those who trust in him definitively apart as God's people. It has paid the full price for our sin. In terms of our standing before the creator, there is nothing else that we must do to receive eternal life except trust in Jesus. We may grow in the degree to which we please God our Father, but our obedience does not secure our right understanding before him or our pardon. That is ours only through the propitiatory work of Christ, wherein he has satisfied the wrath of God 
against our sin and made it possible for his righteousness to be imputed to us. So today, Jesus is in heaven. He was crucified, raised from the dead, ascended to heaven and glorified, where he sits at the right hand of God, interceding for us today. And he who, he, he's, he knows the Father perfectly, so his prayers are perfect prayers. He knows you perfectly, and he knows exactly what to intercede for. So as we go today, let us take heart in that. Pray, pray to the Father. And as the Son is sitting there in intercession, and know his thoughts for you are for good and not for evil. They're for a hope and for a future. And that one day when he will be with us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christ. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would intercede for us. We need your spirit, Lord. We desire to become more and more to display the family resemblance to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give us a boldness, Lord, to live our lives in obedience to you before this world. We pray all this in the name of Christ. Amen.